Hi there, I will be going over the 124 family residential contract. Let's share the screen. Alrighty, so this is the 124 family residential contract. It's created by the Texas Real Estate Commission. Um, it is. It came out in November of 22, but the use is required as of February of 23. So here are the parties, the sellers listed here, the buyer is listed here. Legal description of the property and the street address as well. Street addresses can change and that's why we also include the legal description. Improvements, anything that's permanently attached to uh, with the property stays nailed down, bolted down, okay? It includes things like um, uh, window screens, uh, window rods, uh, uh, mini blinds, uh, um, shutters, uh, garage door openers, um, also includes any accessories like um, stoves, um, fireplace screens, uh, pool equipment, uh, pool cleaning equipment, mailbox keys. Um, if there's anything custom made for the property, it should stay. Now, if there's even, for example, um, alarm system that stays with the property, then um, you would need to pass along the codes for that and the logins as well. Now, if it's a lease like a solar panel or, or anything like that, we do have a separate form for that. The seller wants to reserve or keep anything, they would list it here. Uh, gas, oil, mineral reserves, uh, those usually we don't deal with in El Paso. This now sales price, this is the down payment plus the loan amount equals the sales price. Now it says that the down payment doesn't include money that you're borrowing. So you can't go pull out money from a credit card or uh, get a different loan for the down payment. And also it's not coming from the sale of another property. Now, if you do need to sell another house to purchase this next house, then um, there's a different form that we have that we would add uh, to this contract as well. Leases is if the house is being rented and the uh, tenant stays with the house until their lease is up, but the sale happens before that, that the copy of the leases has to be um, uh, included. And keep in mind that there's a different form for that. Any money deposits that the uh, last owner had uh, has to convey with the property because the um, deposit belongs to the house. It doesn't belong to the owner. Uh, fixtures, um, any fixtures like, again, solar panels, propane tanks, water softener security systems, they'll stay with the property unless otherwise specified. And natural leases, we don't usually deal with those, so I will skip over that. Now, earnest money. Earnest money is the money that the buyer is putting down as proof of good faith. Um, it shows there that the earnest money will be delivered to whatever title company we pick or the buyer picks or we agree to the uh, address of that office with that title officer. This shows what the earnest money will be. This shows what the option will be. I will go over the option here when we go over paragraph two. It says that the buyer has three days to deposit that money. Um, let's say, for example, earnest money is a thousand, option fee is a hundred. They've got to put in eleven hundred dollars in. If, for example, they only put a thousand dollars in, then the first one hundred dollars of that will be applied to the option, and then that will mean that the buyer is still short another one hundred for the earnest money. If the earnest money is a thousand and they only give a thousand and they're short the option. 100 of that will be applied first then the remaining 900 to earnest money. If the earnest money is not there and complete within three days after the effective date of the contract, then the buyer uh, it, in essence doesn't have uh, earnest money deposited and the seller can terminate. So let's say we get an executed contract on a Friday. So within three days of that, that would fall on a Monday. But let's say Monday is a holiday. So then the following day is when it would be due. Okay. Time is of the essence. This is very, very important. It's re reiterated right here under E. All right. So this also explains that when it gets deposited, what gets credited. If the buyer terminates, the buyer does not get their option feedback. If they terminate within the days that they have for the option. So we're going to go into that in a second. But if they if as long as they terminate within that time frame, then they get the rest of the money back, which is the earnest money. If they wait until past that and there's no other provision in the contract for them to cancel, then they would not get the earnest money back. Okay, let's go into uh, termination option. 
So basically, um, the buyer is buying, paying for the right to terminate during the first whatever days is in here. So let's say the buyer writes five days and the seller agrees and we execute the contract on a Friday. So day one of the termination option would begin Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It would end Wednesday on the fifth day at five o'clock in El Paso. Whatever, it doesn't matter if the buyer is in uh, New York or California, it's five o'clock uh, at of uh, uh, in the local time where the property is located. Okay, so again, if the buyer terminates during the first five days, they get the earnest money back. But if they terminate on day six, they technically don't have the right to get earnest money back. Okay, so this explains here failure to timely deliver earnest money basically says that the seller may terminate the contract. Failure to de deliver timely option fee. So let's say they only deliver option, uh, earnest money, but not option. They haven't paid for the option period. They don't have a right to terminate, okay? Time is of the essence, title policy. So seller shall furnish to either the, uh, to the buyer, either at the seller or the buyer's expense, the title policy. It covers clear title of the property by whichever title company is in there. All right, things, uh, let's say, um, you know, they close and then two years later, a contractor shows up and says, hey, the previous owner never paid me for, um, you know, replumbing the house or for doing this repair. Um, the title policy would protect them against the plumber filing suit for something that happened before they own the property, okay? Or let's say the uh, some person comes out of the woodwork and says, I'm the long lost son of the previous owner. I have a right to half of this property or whatever. That would protect them. Things that it does not protect them up if, uh, for is restrictive covenants. So for example, the house was built in an area where, um, you know, uh, it's a regular housing area and, the buyer wants to turn it into a chicken ranch. It doesn't protect them for that because there's rules and certain abilities to use that property. Any standard fees, tax, taxes or assessments, if the buyer, if the new owner doesn't pay their taxes, title policy doesn't protect them against that. Any kind of lien they create because of a loan that they got to finance the property, if they stop paying, title does not cover or protect them for that. Any kind of utility easements, like let's say there's utility lines running in front or in the back of the property, and there's an issue regarding that, they don't cover that because that's a city and utility thing. But that's all those things are usually covered um, in the survey where you get to see where all the utility lines run. Any other reservations or exceptions permitted by the contract and approved in writing of marital rights. Um, if the buyers get a divorce um, and one wants the, the husband wants the property or the wife wants the property and they wind up fighting over it. The title policy doesn't cover that because that's a Texas um, community property issue or, or a divorce issue. Um, water, uh, waters, tidelands, beaches, stream, uh, streams, we don't really have that in El Paso. So it's not really something we uh, deal with a whole lot. And um, anything, any conflicts or shortages in the boundaries or encroachments. So let's say the you live in an older neighborhood or down in the valley and the property line sits a few feet into the property. That does not cover that unless you decide to amend or add extra coverage for that. And the buyer and the seller can decide who will pay for that extra coverage. Um, and then of course, mineral rights, uh, based on the De Texas Department of Insurance. Of course, we don't we don't deal with that because at closing, you, uh, the buyer will see that when they sign that the state of Texas reserves the right to keep any minerals underneath the property. I know, weird thing. Commitment. So 20 days after we have an executed contract, the seller will furnish to the buyer a commitment. It usually comes from title anyway. Um, that'll show any kind of liens against the property. And those would be the big red flags, right? Uh, we usually look at, um, what is it, uh, Schedule C. That's where we see any major liens. Um, the buyer has to get that within 15 days. If he doesn't get it within, I'm sorry, within 20 days. Um, and the buyer, if the uh, it's not delivered to the buyer, uh, they get uh, they will be automatically be extended another 15 days or three days before closing, whatever comes first. That way it gives the buyer the right to review it. If they don't get it, they may uh, 
terminate the contract and get their earnest money back. Um, survey. The survey shows the property boundary lines. This says whether or not how many days within the effective date of the contract the seller shall furnish to the buyer a survey. And uh, if they have to order a new survey, if it's the seller or the buyer that will pay for a new one. However, if let's say um, we have 10 days there, right? The, the seller has 10 days to furnish uh, the buyer uh, a survey. If the seller fails to furnish an existing survey or affidavit within the time prescribed, the buyer shall obtain a new one at the seller's expense, no later than three days prior to closing. So that's why it's very important here that if the buyer seller does not have a survey that they say that they don't have a survey, right? And then you can check here whether the seller or the buyer will pay for a new survey, okay? Um, objections. Um, the buyer may put in writing any objections that they have um, that prohibit the following use. So we don't enter residential use in here because the contract is already a residential contract. It's used for residential use. We would enter something different here. For example, if the buyer is buying the property with the idea that they're going to turn it into a chicken ranch, they would enter chicken ranch. Okay. Otherwise, we leave it blank if it's going to be used for residential use. Now, buyer has so many days in writing after they receive the commitment to put in writing any objections that they have, okay? So for example, if the seller has a huge tax lien against them, the buyer would have to put in writing so many days after receive the commitment that they object to that, and the seller has 15 days to cure it. If they cannot, object, if they cannot cure it within that time, then the buyer <clears throat> will give them um, the, um, they have the right to cancel and <coughs> walk away. Or they, if they don't put in writing that objection, they're basically waiving the right to object. So it's very important to pay attention to those things. <coughs> Excuse me. It also covers the survey, um, revised commitment, that kind of thing. Title notices. Um, if the buyer wants to hire an attorney to do an abstract of title, they can. Normally, we don't see that happening because the title the title commitment shows and the title company title policy covers any kind of issues there. An abstract of title is like a mini history that shows the chain of ownership for that property. I've heard of those being used um, when you have property that was passed along from one generation to another. Uh, many years down the road and clear title ownership was not recorded. Um, buyer always has a right to have an attorney look over the title policy or to do an abstract of title. Now, if the property is in an HOA, a mandatory HOA, then we would check it here is, there is a separate form that we use where we outline um, how many, how soon and at whose cost the copy of all of that information will be relayed. It's very important that the buyer read over all the restrictive covenants because it'll outline how they can keep the property up, what kind of changes they can and cannot do, that sort of thing. Now, the amount of the assessment uh, can change. So for example, if HOA fees are 150 a month, they can go up. So it's very important that you read through that if the buyer, if the new owner does not pay for the mandatory HOA fees, then they can have a lien put against them by the HOA and even foreclose on the property. So very important. There's a resale certificate that includes all the uh, limited to statements specifying the amount and frequency of assessments, all that good information. If the buyer is concerned um, about these matters, we use the addendum for property subject to mandatory association use, okay? Statutory tax district, if there was a special utility or uh, uh, utility uh, created, for example, for water, sewer, drainage, floods, if there's a special tax district for those kind of uh, fees, then uh, it's important that we notify you. Um, we usually don't see those here either. Uh, tidewaters, remember, these contracts are for the entire state of Texas, so we usually won't see tidewaters because we're not beachfront, right? Annexation, if the house is outside of the city limits, we have to let you know, because at some point, uh, it, the city may annex and bring that in, and then there would be, of course, city taxes due. Um, usually, uh, 
I would say 99% of the properties that I deal with don't have an annexation um, issue come up ever, okay? Because usually they are within the city limits. If it's in a certified uh, area of utility ser service provider, for example, um, if you go out into Hacienda del Norte, there's a certain water company that they use out there. So we have to notify you of those type of things. If it's a regular subdivision in El Paso, we don't see that come up. Public improvement district. Okay, this we do see in certain areas of new construction where um, at the, the builder will usually tell you, look, there's a public improvement district. Um, it's for quality of life things like parks and walkways and stuff like that. Um, they give you the ability to pay it all up front or they give you the ability to pay it a little bit every year, which most people do. And even if you sell the property, the new property owner would take that over as well. Okay. Transfer fees, we don't see those a whole lot, but if there's any kind of special transfer fees, we have to notify you of that. If it's part of a propane gas system service area, we also have to notify you. Most of the properties in El Paso are connected to Texas gas, okay? So we don't see that. Uh, notice to water uh, water level fluctuations. If this was a um, uh, lakefront property, we have to notify you of fluctuations in water levels. We don't see that either. And then any kind of notices for these, MUD, WCID, PID, which we went over the public improvement district would be here. And then access and inspections and utilities. Okay, seller um, has to have utilities on. It has to give the buyer reasonable hours for access to get the house uh, inspected. It has to be, the inspector has to use a licensed inspector um, or otherwise, like if it's like a plumbing thing, they have to use a licensed plumber to do that license, that plumbing inspection. Um, now, if the buyer wants to do a special kind of test called a hydrostatic test, we have to get separate permission for that. It, it measures the water pressure of the pipes. That's required simply because when you do that kind of test, there's always a possibility of rupturing a pipe. We never see, well, I've never seen that here. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but we usually don't use that kind of test here. Um, the hydrostatic. The regular, yes. Now it is also the seller's responsibility to have all utilities on. So if you're a seller, please make sure all your utilities are on at the moment that we have the house listed for sale or that we go under contract because sometimes there is a lag period for certain utility companies and that's eating up into the buyer's option period. Um, seller's disclosure. The seller is required to disclose everything they know Good, bad, and ugly doesn't mean that they're going to be aware of everything, but it's important that um, the buy the seller do fill it out as accurately as possible. And if they don't know something, they have to put unknown or do not know. Um, the buyer checks here whether they have received a copy or they have not. If the buyer has not received a copy of the seller's disclosure, um, then they automatically have seven days after they do receive it. So let's say they write a contract, it gets executed on a Friday and they have a five-day option, which means they have until Wednesday at five to terminate, but they did not get a copy of the seller's disclosure, which means that if they didn't get the seller's disclosure until Monday, then they automatically get seven days after that. Very important to get seller's disclosure from the get-go, okay? If the property was built before 1978, then uh, federal law requires that this form be filled out on any knowledge for lead-based paint. Uh, acceptance of the property con condition is as is. That's the default. However, it does not keep the buyer from using their option period to negotiate uh, any kind of repairs to get inspections done and to still terminate. Just because it means as is doesn't mean that that's the only and final word on repairs. Buyer and seller can still negotiate repairs during that option period. If they cannot come to an agreement and the buyer chooses to terminate, then they can without penalty. The only thing they would lose would be the money they paid for the inspection if they did and the option fee, but the earnest money would be re uh, uh, refunded to them by the title company. All right, so buyer will check as is, still use their option period or if there's only certain specific repairs that the buyer wants to ask for, they would enter it here. 
they cannot enter very general phrases like subject to inspections or lender required repairs. Those are very vague. We cannot put that in there, okay? Um, lender required repairs. Neither the seller nor the buyer obligated to repairs as a standard. It is all negotiable, okay? Um, let's say we get inspections done, we negotiate repairs, the appraiser goes out and then comes back and says, this is what the house appraises for, but certain things have to be done. We get to negotiate those items. If those repairs equal more than 5% of the sales price, the buyer automatically gets the right to terminate, okay? Now, it doesn't mean they can't negotiate or try to negotiate, but that's, that's an out that the buyer is given. Completion of repairs and treatments. All right, seller shall complete all repairs that he agrees to prior to the closing date, okay? It could be a week before, it could be a day before, as long as it's done by closing. And they have to get any permits if required. If the person, the kind of work that is agreed to requires a license that they must use somebody for that. If somebody, if the, if like, let's say it's paint, if, uh, if there's no license required by law, um, they are also commercially engaged in trade or performing of such repairs and treatments, okay? Unless it's specified differently, right? Seller should provide the buy buyer a copy of the documents for that repair, showing the scope of the work and the payment. And at the seller's expense, arrange for transfer of transferable warranties with respect to the repairs and treatments. So let's say uh, you had a new roof put over. We have to make sure that we get a copy of the invoice for the roof and make sure that the roofing company allows for the transfer of the warranty of the roof, okay? If the, fail, if the seller fails to complete any agreed repairs and treatments prior to closing, buyer may exercise remedies under paragraph 15 or extend closing an extra five days, okay? If necessary for seller to complete the repairs and treatments. So we'll go over paragraph 15 in a minute. Environmental re, uh, matters, if buyers worried about any kind of things like asbestos, toxic substances, wetlands, they have a right to have uh, an inspector check for those items. You usually don't see that. Residential service contract, that is the home warranty. Buyer may purchase a home warranty or ask the seller to pay for a home warranty not to exceed the amount in here. The home warranty company is optional, but if you do want to get a home warranty, whether the seller pays or the buyer pays, um, it has to be from one that's authorized to do business in Texas, okay? Very important, because not all home warranties are licensed in Texas. All right, brokers and sales agents. Um, this says that if either one of the parties, um, the realtors in either party, has at least 10% or more of ownership on the property, um, we have to disclose that, okay? So that's where we would enter it here. For example, if I was the owner and this, and also the agent, I have to disclose uh, owner is a licensed real estate agent in Texas, okay? Or if I'm part of a of a, a, a an investor group that owns this property because we flipped it, I also have to disclose that information, okay? Uh, broker's fees, um, who pays for the broker is already pre-decided. Normally the seller pays their agent a certain uh, percentage, uh, and usually that agent will split their commission with the buyer's agent for procuring the buyer. It is not part of this. This agreement is only between buyer and seller, okay? Closing. Closing will happen on or before whatever date is here or within seven days after objections made have been cured or waived, okay? If either party fails to close, then the defaulting part, the non-defaulting party may exercise the remedies in page Paragraph 15, basically, who wants the earnest money or if they decide to sue, right? So um, we'll go over that in a little bit. At closing, sell, at closing seller shall uh, sign any kind of documents legally transferring it. Buyer shall pay the sales price in good funds. That would be uh, down payment, closing costs, uh, and get the loan. Um, and then, um, or uh, at closing, a uh, seller and buyer shall execute and deliver any notices and statements, loan documents, transfer warranties, title policy. Um, there will be no liens on the property except for the loan that the buyer gets, right? And um, sales proceeds and less secure payment of all loans. Okay, private transfer fees. If there's any kind of transfer fees involved, they will be paid for HOA, that sort of thing. Or if there's a special 
a kind of transfer fee for a condo or something, right? Buyer's possession. Um, buyer has a right to get keys upon closing and funding, and there can be regular wear and tear. So the rule of thumb is if the house was clean when the buyer did the walkthrough, that's the kind of clean that the house has to be when they close, okay? Regular wear and tear. Now, if there's something crazy like a big old rip in the carpet or a big old hole in the wall, that's not considered wear and tear, okay? And the buyer will not get keys until everybody's signed and uh, the title company has received all the funds needed to fund the sale. So for example, everybody signs on a Friday, but the seller's out of town. And the, and the documents don't get back until Monday. When the docu the original documents get back on Monday from either seller or buyer, whatever the case may be, then the title company will request that the lender send the wire for the money. Once that wire hits the title company's account, then we have funding and the buyer has a right to get keys. If um, the seller doesn't have to receive the funds in their bank account, it, as long as it hits the title company's bank account, they get fee, they get the keys. Now, if there's a separate agreement where the buyer, or the seller are allowed to move in or stay longer, then we have a separate agreement for that. And that would be a temporary lease. Okay. Consult your insurance company if you're an owner or a buyer, depending on the possession, because we want to make sure that there's some kind of um, insurance coverage on the property. Uh, whether the seller or the buyer is living it, in it already, okay? We would hate for something to happen and then uh, it's not covered because insurance lapsed, okay? Smart devices. For example, if you have a security system and ha requires a login on your phone and a password, those have to be conveyed to the, to the buyer um, with access codes, username, passwords, all that. Or they have to terminate and remove all access. Also, the last owner has to remove themselves from access. And if there's any kind of special provisions, we would enter it here. Um, it would have to be verbiage that either the buyer or the seller wants to use, and it has to be very specific to this contract. As realtors, we are not allowed to practice law, so we cannot come up with verbiage. Um, settlement and other expenses. At closing, the seller will pay off any liens that they have, any taxes, anything that's pending um, or can create a cloud on the title. And if the seller agrees to help the buyer with their closing costs, this amount would be inserted here. That would be applied to the buyer's closing costs that it would be allowed by either their conventional FHA or VA or Texas Vet Landward loan. And if there's any money left over that they're not allowed to use in those programs, the buyer doesn't keep the money, okay? Only what's applicable gets paid. If there's any leftover money, it stays with the seller, okay? Expenses paid by the buyer are outlined here. Um, all the loan fees that the lender has already given the buyer in their quote um, at the loan application, um, it cannot be used. This, this money here cannot be used for down payment. Keep that in mind. Now, if this amount does not cover all the buyer's closing costs, the buyer is responsible for the difference, okay? Um, taxes for the current year have to be prorated. So let's say if we close in June, seller is responsible for taxes from January to June. That will be a credit to the buyer at closing so that at the end of the year, the buyer has enough money in their escrow account to pay for the first six months that the seller gave them credit for and the last six months that they paid into, okay? Um, casualty loss. If the property is damaged or destroyed by fire or other kind of loss, seller shall restore the property to the, per to the previous condition as reasonably as possible, but in any event by closing date. If the fail seller fails to do that, buyer may terminate and get the earnest money back or extend the time by another 15 days um, or uh, accept the property in its damaged condition, okay, and will receive uh, insurance proceeds if permitted by the seller's insurance or receive a credit from the seller, okay? So it's all that is negotiable. Something happens, the buyer can cancel, extend the extra few days, take it as is, and negotiate how they're going to be compensated for the damages, right? Default. If, fail, if buyer fails to comply with the contract, they are in default, and the seller can either uh, sue them to make them 
follow through with the sale or keep the earnest money, but they cannot do both. If the seller fails to comply, same thing applies. The buyer can sue or keep the earnest money, but they cannot do both. If there's a disagreement, everybody goes agrees to go to mediation first. It's cheaper and it's faster. But in the, but in the event that they do wind up in court, the loser may have to pay the winner's attorney's fees. Okay, Escrow. The title company uh, is the escrow agent. They are not a party to the contract. They are not required to um, represent one or the other or enforce the contract, right? Um, or loss of earnest money, okay? They are there to collect good funds and get the paperwork signed for closing and to make sure that there's clear title. Now, at closing, the earnest money will be applied first to the down payment. Any money left over that will be for closing costs. If there's no closing, the escrow company may release the earnest money to all parties, but let's say um, there's a disagreement, they terminate, the buyer wants the earnest money, they have to put it in writing and submit it to title. Then the title has to get the seller to sign off, and if they sign off, then the money gets released to the buyer or vice versa. However, if there's a, a disagreement on how um, the earnest money will be uh, released, then um, they have to put in demand in writing uh, demand the earnest money. Um, basically, it stays in limbo. And if let's say the seller puts in demand in writing that they want the earnest money, they send it to the buyer. The buyer never res doesn't respond after 15 days. Then the title company will usually reimburse that money to the seller. Okay. Um, and I do have to go back under expenses. Uh, this basically says let's say they ordered. Let's say there's a um, thousand dollars of earnest money. A survey was ordered and was done, and the contract doesn't go through. If that falls through, then whoever ordered the survey is going to be liable for paying that survey. Okay, so if the buyer ordered the survey, then the the survey money will be taken out of the thousand dollars that they're getting back if they do get that money back. Okay, all right. Any party who wrongfully fails or refuses to sign within seven days of receipt of request will be liable to the other party for damages. It can also mean uh, fees for attorneys. So it's very important that all parties respond in a timely fashion. Uh, representations, all covenants, representations, warranties survive the contract unless put in writing. And the buyer may still show the, pro I mean, the seller may still show the property to other buyers and get backup contracts. Okay, the backup contract cannot knock out the first place contract out of its position unless they're the first contract um, rescinds or defaults. Okay, now if the seller is a foreign national, we have to uh, notify all parties because the IRS will hold back a portion of their proceeds until they um, are able to file their tax returns and pay any kind of taxes they owe. Um, notifications will be done in writing to the buyer at this information and copied to their agent down here. Same with the seller, seller's information and the agent's information down here. If there's anything else additionally attached to the contract, it we will check the box that uh, it applies to. So third party financing, if they're getting a loan, if the seller's financing it, it's part of an HOA, uh, temporary lease, uh, it's a backup contract. Um, Addendum concerning right to terminate due to a lender's appraisal. That's another type of form that we've seen a lot in the last few years. Uh, temporary lease for the seller, lead-based paint. If, for example, the um, the stole the dish the washer, dryer, and refrigerator stays with the property, then we would check this and enter non-realty items addendum. Or let's say lawn lawn furniture, something like that, right? Now, um, we would enter the buyer's attorney here, the seller's attorney here. For the most part, um, we I usually put to be determined if the if my client doesn't have an attorney, which most people don't. Um, the If a need for an attorney arises, the, the client always has a right to uh, get an attorney. This page only shows the execution date of the contract. This will not be dated until all parties have agreed to all terms. Everybody has signed initialed and initialed any changes and then we would finally put the date 
that that happened on here and we would deliver a copy to the other agent on the same day, okay? This doesn't require a seller or buyer signature, just shows which agent represents the buyer, which agent represents the seller, and how the buyer's agent will be compensated by the seller's agent. And then these are the receipt pages for earnest money and option fee, okay? So I hope that helps. I know it's a lengthy video, but it is very important for you to understand all the terms in the contract. And if you have any questions, you can always let me know. Thank you. Bye-bye.